All right, hello again, and uh, welcome to another Facebook Live installment interview of the candidates, uh, this one being for the St. Johns County Board of Commissioners, seat four uh, by the editorial board of the St. Augustine by Jeremiah Blocker, a Republican, and John Jack Gorman, an independent candidate. My name is Mark Cox. I'm the general manager of the St. Augustine Record. With me here today are opinion page editor Jim Sutton and executive editor Craig Richardson. So to start things off today, I'd like to have each of you take a couple minutes to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and why you're running for office, and we will get started with Mr. Blocker. Thank you. Well, I appreciate y'all taking the opportunity to talk to us today. Um, I'm running for County Commission here in St. John's County because I have a young family. I have a young son, a young daughter, and we love living here. We think it's a wonderful place to live, but we have some important challenges coming up. We have some challenges for how we're growing, our traffic, business growth, things of that nature. And I think that we need people on the County Commission that can understand that, that have a stake in the game, that are vested in the community. Um, I have a vested interest in seeing our county remain a beautiful place to live. I'm raising children here. I think it's important that they have, you know, wonderful parks to go to, a safe community, schools first. Um, that's important. In my background, I come from a military background. I've led troops in combat. I continue to serve. Uh, spent time in the Army, now I'm a JAG officer in the Air Force Reserve, also a former prosecutor, so I've had the chance to prosecute crime in this community. I understand the danger that we can face if we don't keep a, a handle on that and keep this a safe place to live. Uh, I'm a small business owner, I employ people here in the county, and I work on helping small businesses uh, kind of navigate the moralysis of, of local government and get through that. Um, I want to see St. John's County be the most efficient county in the state of Florida. I think we have some challenges to that. I think we have to work through that. But I believe in the vision of the people in this community. I think we can come up with a vision for how we're going to grow, what that growth is going to look like. We can keep this a wonderful place to live. Ready? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll be a little shorter. Yeah, my name is uh, John C. Horman. Call me Jack. Uh, I'm a merchant man. I had been at sea for most of my life as far as commercial. I've run both ships and tugs uh, for a living. So that means I've been millions of miles at sea. I've been in St. Augustine since 1972. And when I got here, this was a magical place. It was just a small Spanish town surrounded by farmland. And just in the last few years, I watched it turn into a place that, uh, well, for instance, it took me 40 minutes to drive here, and that's just from north of the airport. I've watched what I consider uncontrolled growth. Uh, and that's why I'm uh, running. But uh, other than that, uh, as far as my background, it's, it's strictly merchant marine for years and years. I have a question. And normally they're for both candidates, but this one just be just for you. Why are you running NPA? Why am I running NPA? Well, let's see. He had the uh, NPA. I, partisan politics, I think, is killing the country. I really do. It's not. It's just because uh, we're arguing all the time and we're not solving anything. And yet I see Democrats that have good ideas. So I see Republicans that have good ideas. And I understand why we spend all our time arguing and not all our time fixing things. And so uh, when I could, I ran NPA. Uh, and I would run NPA if I had the choice of either one, only because it's philosophy. I, we need to bring both sides together and stop arguing. Can, can I weigh in on those? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, I think one of the most important things is if you're elected to this position, you have to represent everybody. You have to represent the Democrats, Republicans, Independents. And I think it's important to build that common ground. You know, this is about clean water. This is about safe streets. This is about our kids being able to go to school and be safe. This is not about partisan politics. This is about local politics. I think so. Even though I am a conservative Republican, I believe in limited government. I believe in conservative values. I'm going to work with everybody. I think that's important. I have Democrat neighbors. I have independent neighbors. I have Republican neighbors. At the end of the day, we got to figure out our traffic issues, our mobility issues. We got to figure out how we're going to grow, and that that transcends party lines. That's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. That's that's a people of St. John's issue. So I think that's important. Okay, there may be something coming up, a, a pretty big push this year because you you all brought the same thing up is to take the legislature a proposition to make the county commission a nonpartisan body. Would either one of you 
either support or oppose that type of thing? Who goes first? Go ahead. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I was on the airport board for eight years. <clears throat> and during my eight years on the airport board, it was nonpartisan. And we just focused on issues. There was no tribal warfare. And I thought that during those eight years, so I'll bring it a little bit, we actually got the airport off the tax rolls. We built a huge expansion, and uh, during that expansion, uh, we did an environmentally, uh, uh, what I would call, sensitive and creative uh, design. We made a, uh, we got a national award for environmentally sensitive uh, award for the design of the airport, and we had no infighting on that. Once we got going as a team, it worked really well, and I was proud of that, and so was the rest of the board. I think it's something certainly to be open to. I think it's important to remember, though, it's not just about whether it's a, there's a label you know, after your name or not. I think we've all been a part of boards or different committees where even when there's not politics in it, the people create issues and create politics. I think what's important is the attitude of common ground. I think you have to have a vision and a mission. I think you have to identify that. So whether there's a an R or a D that follows your name or nonpartisan, I think you really have to approach this with the right attitude. If you're if you're coming into this to create conflict or to have issues, I think there's a problem. I think you have to identify what the local issues are, what the role of that particular government body is, and focus on that. Even with our, our school board, they're nonpartisan, they still have issues, there's still politics involved in that. So it's not so much the labels that go with it, it's more the attitude and the approach. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Perlman, you said in your opening statements that one of your concerns was uncontrolled growth. Uh, how, what is what does that mean to you? Is that what you're hearing, and why you're running specifically, and what can a what can a county commissioner do to check growth? Well, the, the uncontrolled growth to me means when it takes me 45 minutes to run here, and at two o'clock in the afternoon, I've seen uh, if you go go in different parts of the county, you'll see huge spaces of uh, clear cutting, and uh, I don't feel the clear cutting. Uh, good thing to do. And you'll see uh, uh, just the actual roads are not keeping up with the construction. In other words, they can build a thousand homes in a twinkling of an eye and yet the roads and the right away for roads and the all the accoutrements that it takes to build a road takes forever. And so right now the residents are suffering through just pure traffic. And the only solution for that, as far as I can see, is holding up more permitting of planned urban developments until the roads can catch up, the infrastructure can catch up. And I can go on and on about that because I've been, I've uh, been with the, uh, the uh, budget people. I've talked to them. I've talked to the school people. I've talked to them, and both of them have said the budget people have told me that the roads are not well funded. They're playing catch up. They're not, they're not, they're just playing catch up. They're not really getting ahead on the roads. And the school people tell me unless the, the actual rate of uh, building slows down, they're not going to be able to get rid of these, uh, these classrooms that they have to lease, these trailers behind there. So the, the actual rate of growth is hampering the quality of life in the, in the uh, county itself. Well, I think what's important to point out is that if you don't approve another single permit, we have about ten to 15,000 homes already approved. So the growth is coming no matter what you do. When it comes to transportation, we def def defunded the transportation trust fund about 10 years ago. We transferred some of that millage rate and put it over into the general fund. So we need to go back and look at putting more dollars back into our transportation trust. We fully fund it, fully fund the roads, fully work on that infrastructure. As far as our growth and how we're doing that, specifically we have a future land use map that we're not adhering to. We have a comprehensive land use map that we haven't tied into our future land use map. We have a land use code that goes at things like clearing uh, that, that really is harmful. Um, so there are a lot, there's a lot we have to look at how we do land use in this county. You have to operate within the law, too, because people want to move here. Well, you can't have the best schools in the state of Florida and a great place to live and people not want to move here. So we have to find ways to work within the law, law to respect private property rights, but also to manage the growth better. And there are ways that you can do that. We're not the first county in Florida that's dealt with tremendous growth. But other counties have done a better job managing it better and making sure that's more centralized and focused. we got to figure out where do we want to grow? How do we want that growth to look like? And what do the people want? You know, do we want do we want more commercial that's going to add more jobs? Do we want to try to limit the residential? So there's a lot that we have to sift through and figure that out. 
But starting from today, we have 10 to 15,000 home sites that have already been approved, so the growth is coming. What we have to do is get that infrastructure in place. We have to start with that, and I'm calling these roads to do a better job. And there are pieces to the puzzle we can add to make that happen. So 15,000 more are coming, but every month there's another development going in front of the board uh, asking for approval. Would you say no, or would you say yes, or would you consider these on a, on a case by case? I'll start this time with you. I think you have to. I think, you know, when, when you're saying like Kenneth Commission, it's a quasi judicial role. You know, part of your job there is to hear all the evidence, to hear competent and pertinent evidence. That's, that's the legal standard. And part of your job in that quasi judicial role is to evaluate. So some developments are probably good, and some, some people want them, some are probably bad. But you have to evaluate each one. And I think what you have to ask yourself is is this going to add to the value of the community? Or is it just going to add more traffic in this particular part of the county? Is it going to be good for our families? So I think you really have to take that approach. You know, when I'm evaluating a development, I want to hear all the evidence. I want to hear all the competent evidence because that's important. I don't think you can sit here and say no development and then get up there and quasi judicial role and do that. But I think you have to ask yourself: If you approve this development, is this going to add to our infrastructure issues? Is it going to make it more complicated for people to get their kids to school, or is this going to add to quality of life? Is this going to put a Publix here where the people want a grocery store? Is this going to put some doctor's offices here so people don't have to drive to Jacksonville? So I think you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, legally. Um, I'm not what sure. Did, 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 uh, I'm sorry, you read here. It's true. In other words, I think that we may have just turned the corner a slight amount because recently the county commissioners turned down the King's Grant and King's Grant was a very dense 1,000 home uh, development that was going to be built at the intersection basically of uh, 206, 207, and 95. But the only way to get in and out of there was 95 or the 206, 207. And that's a little country road. And again, like Mr. Black was saying, you've got to, what type of quality is that going to be? That's not even possible. It's right now we have 210. And if you go right up to 10 and you look around, it looks like a moonscape. There's so much clear cutting and so much. It's completely cleared. And I cannot imagine how all those people are going to get out of all of those wafer belt homes. I call it wafer board, whatever, and get anywhere. In other words, I don't understand how that engineering came true. And I think that uh, it's my own opinion that the lust for this uh, and the county commission for these impact fees drove them to be able to uh, to permit all these. And I don't like correcting or going back, but I was told, I've, I've been parroting 20,000 permits on the books. And not to, to uh, decry anything that Mr. Blocker said, but I talked to the county commissioners and said, it's 50,000. And in two years ago, it was 77,000. I believe it's, right. Right. it's over 70,000. So it is out of control. And that's got they've been, they've been developing silver beef is 20,000. Yeah. So, I mean, but I think 70,000 is that, but we understand this, and this, this is probably the main question I have to you guys about growth is you can't, you can't say no, you can't come in or yes, you can't come in. If you, if, if you're, let's take King's Grant, King's Grant has those 700 acres and they had their development rights were set when they bought it. The problem with the growth in this county is not what the development rights are, it's what they want in addition to. That's why they always try to go to PUD, just like King's Grant, to wipe the slate clean and be able to do this. And that, I believe, has been the main problem in the county. It's not been what people are allowed to do on their land. That's private property rights. It's the excesses that they want, not only want, but I think you can see in the case of King Grant demand. So my question, to me, the most basic question about growth in St. John County is, do developers, do, does the county commission have a responsibility to maximize the profits of developers coming into this county? No, absolutely okay. not. And I just want to go to something you said. It's bigger than, than the problem you identified. I know you did a good job pointing that out. We don't have a growth vision for this county. We don't know how we want to grow. If you ask people in this county, elected officials or, or citizens, you know, what is our vision for growth? They have no idea. No one has any concept of that because, again, we have a future land use map that we don't adhere to. We have a conference land use plan that we don't adhere to. It changes from year to year. So I think we need to go back to the basics of, of, of 
of land use identify you know, how we're going to grow, what that growth is going to look like. And we owe that to our citizens. You have people that bought property here that moved here with their families, expected one thing. Now you have a major development coming up behind them. So it's not the development's good or bad. It's the county is failing its citizens because we're not handling our land use the appropriate way. We haven't identified a vision. We haven't synced everything up behind that. And that's going to be an ongoing problem. We're going to run from problem to problem until we figure that out. And we have to tie all this together. Um, so it's not just an issue of, of, you know, we're approving too much developments or we're not, or private, private property rights. What is our vision for growth? How are we going to make sure a comprehensive land use plan reflects that? And what's that going to look like? Uh, 10, 15 years from now, because really the decisions we're making today are going to affect us 10 or 15 years from now. They're going to affect my kids for the next 10 or 15 years. I have young children. So it's in everyone's interest to figure that out and make sure that we, we, we go from here. You're going to continue to have these projects where, uh, you know, there's variances or there's, there's different or there's legal disputes about the growth that's going in here in lawsuits. We have to figure out how our comprehensive land use plan, future land use map is going to tie together going forward. Okay. I think we're starting to turn the corner. After they turned down King's Grant, which was a very dense uh, population, and uh, was no in and out, we discussed that. They just now, the PCA, the Planning and Zoning, have just approved and gotten their ducks in a line to be able to go 2209, which is a north-south artery. And if that artery, which has now been approved by them, is built, uh, they've actually taken and moved the, the permitting of, of uh, the homes ahead of that. So they're in concurrency, word concurrency, they're going to be building the road, is my understanding, and then starting granting permits to build homes. And the density of those homes is going to be two homes per acre. So that's not a, a density that is going to be un, unsustainable. But before they've been granting permits for unsustainable density. So I think they're starting to see the light and the county commissioners that exist right now. And that whole trend has got to keep going. It's it's it can't, you know, we can't get waivers. We can't just let the developers do what they've been doing. Until now, and I do see a little turn to the corner, the tail has been wagging the dog. The developer tail has been wagging the county dog. Mm -hmm. And that's just by necessity been changing because it's not sustainable. Um, both of you talked about funding infrastructure, fixing roads, making sure our roads can support the development that's that's on its way, that's approved already. Um, as you both know, there's an amendment on the, on the ballot that will probably add to uh, or subtract from the revenue streams if it's passed it's for the uh, homestead exemption. Um, Estimates say that'll subtract $10 million a year in county revenue. How can we fix roads, county roads, uh, with not only the revenue we have now, but possibly a smaller pot come November and January? And they've just, and uh, <clears throat> the police have just spent $14, uh, $14 million on a training facility. And the training facility is going to be paid for by impact fees. Uh, it's to me, and that's one of the reasons I was running because we're going to be in management by crisis mode shortly. There's not enough money. I don't see it. You can look at the budget all you want and uh, and try to memorize the figures, but the schools that have to borrow money to be able to get to the capacity they need to, with roads where the impact fees are actually behind, we're fixing roads with the impact fees that we are are getting now from the developers. And the way the developers pay the impact fees is they pay when they electrify a house. You don't get some big lump sum. You get one $8,700 payment when the lights go on in the house. So I see it management by crisis shortly because they have granted too many permits and they overextended. So, so what are the options for finding revenue to fund infrastructure? What, what do you see? Uh, easily, well, they've already started with the sales tax, <clears throat> and uh, but there's only so much you're going to be able to do that before the uh, before the uh, the general public is going to rebel against that. Uh, it's just going to be that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to actually oh, you're going to have to change the ordinances, and you're going to have to raise the impact fees. And I'm told that the uh, 
by developers, oh, we have the highest impact fees. Well, they're not paying the freight now, so they're going to have to go up. If this is such a good place to build, it's going to have to be a more expensive good place to build because we're going to drown truck. So we have the highest impact fees in the state of Florida right now. We still have revenue issues. So impact fees are not the solution to that problem. When you look at other communities in Florida that have moved away from impact fees, they don't have the revenue issues that we're having. What impact, high impact fees have done is it's prevented commercial growth coming in here, which actually pays for itself and puts more revenue into our economy. So you have right outside the St. John's County line, you have all these buildings going up. They don't want to you know, put a 100,000 square foot building in St. John's County, pay a million dollars in impact fees. So the County Commission has recently adjusted that and lowered the impact fees for commercial, hopefully to attract more commercial growth here. But really, the, the, the biggest thing we can do right now to address our transportation needs is we need to go back and fully fund it. Back during the economic downturn, they took some of those dollars and put it into uh, the general fund. We need to, you know, you don't have to raise property taxes. You know, the goal is to not raise up property taxes. Let's adjust that millage rate. Let's put more dollars and fully fund the, the transportation fund that's in place here. We have half of St. John's County is, is a PUD right now. So that means residents such as myself are paying CDDs to fund a lot of the infrastructure. So St. John's County is not paying for a lot of these roads. The developers put the roads in, and then the citizens are paying for it. So there should be revenue there. Now, going back to, to this tax, first of all, whether that amendment's passed or not, we're still gonna have a revenue problem. So it doesn't matter whether we have an extra 10 million to work with, we're still gonna have a revenue problem. So we have to work with that and, and identify that. Now every year, anchor, or the revenue from, from uh, Avalorum taxes has gone up. If you talk to Eddie Creamer, you're looking at, who's a, who's a property appraiser, we go up about in, between 10 to 20 million a year. So you're looking about 20 million extra dollars every year. Now, if they pass this tax reform, that's going to cut about, estimate about 10 million out of that. So instead of having an extra 20 million or 15 million, you'll have maybe five or 10 to work with. But we're still adding revenue to the budget. We need to figure out where those priorities are. And I would say right now, after knocking on 13,000 doors in the county, transportation's a major issue. So that's, that, that should be a quick, decisive fix. You have to go in and adjust that and put those dollars back into the Transportation Trust Fund. That has to happen. Where, where does the money come from? Ten years ago, they adjusted the millage rate, put part of that millage into the, the general fund. The general fund pays everything from salaries to, to whatever projects that comes up. So again, one of the, one of the, the legal lawful responsibilities of local government is to pay for infrastructure. That, that's our responsibility. We have to pay for the firefighters, you have to pay for law enforcement, you have to pay for the roads. Um, you don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul to do that. You readjust that, put more more dollars back into that. We have one of the largest planning and zoning staffs in the state of Florida. I think we need to to, to make sure that our, our roads are funded first, our infrastructure, and then we can look at these other other issues as well. Back to the economic downturn, they felt that our infrastructure was caught up and that they could delay some of that maintenance and, and adjust those dollars over to probably a great decision at the time, but 10 years later, we, we need to go back and we look at that and shift those dollars back. Um, that, that won't affect people's taxes, will not raise taxes, but we'll put more dollars in so we can do the road maintenance we need to. Well, if you move money from one place to the other, the other has less money. And the county's answer to that is always, it's going to be your public libraries and your parks. I mean, that's... That's where they come from, because I think it's, and, and many people think that may be a threatening sort of thing. Do you? Well, I didn't agree with that. I mean, we, we've had great libraries and great parks for years. We had them great 10 years ago, but we had an economic downturn. We had to adjust to mm -hmm. that. You know, government is not immune for economic downturns. You have to adjust for that. But the important is, you know, the, the, the requirement is, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we have safe roads, we want to make sure it's a little safely, and we also want to make sure that we can have our libraries. You don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul. We're not the only county in Florida that's faced economic challenges. You know, counties all over Florida address this, find ways of doing it, but we need to think outside the box. We need to be innovative. We need to go back and look at that. And there are ways that we can do that without raising taxes, without doing that. And again, until we've exhausted those efforts, I think we need to, to be open to new ideas. I have to disagree with Mr. Blacker finally. <clears throat> um, what created the problem? And then what do the residents get? What created the problem? In other words, this explosive growth has created the problem. And what do the residents get out of this? They don't get anything. And so who's going to pay? And to me, if in fact, this explosive growth caused the problems, why can't we put the impact fees higher? Why not? I don't understand that. 
I heard the word millage. You mean millage? You mean we're going to pay more in property taxes? No. Then where is the money? I got to ask, where's the money? So, so the impact fees that come in are, if you stop development, you're going to lose those impact fees. If you drive development, you're not going to get the impact fees. <laughs> so if we're, going to stop, if we're going to stop going forward with development, you're going to lose impact fees. Under the law, it has to be tied to that specific purpose. You don't have to raise tap property taxes. You can adjust the millage to do that. It will not raise taxes. Right now, they put it, 10 years ago, they put it part of the millage into, <coughs> into the general fund. You can readjust that to adjust for some issues they had at that time, because our infrastructure was caught up at that time, so they felt like they could take the hit on that. But now our infrastructure is falling behind. We have over 200 million in deferred maintenance and infrastructure. That's gonna affect our roads, that's gonna affect our ability. That's, that's creating a lot of the congestion that we have. So you have to adjust that. Um, if, if we're relying on impact fees, which are not bondable, you can't bond it. So you can't use it for anything like that. So you're gonna have to continue to allow massive growth here in the county. And we've already talked about when that's not a good idea. We have to be very measured in the growth that we let into the county. Um, look, you know, I like good developments. I live in a really nice development. The residents there love it, but that's not good for every part of the county. The citizens in the county have to make up their minds about what, what, what areas they want to grow and how they want to fund that. And that's not, you're not going to answer that with one shot. You have to look at it comprehensively. That's, that's all I'm saying. But we're not raising property taxes. That's, that, that's, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna solve the problem and it's not, not fair to put that burden on the citizens. But you have to recognize that impact fees, if you're gonna slow down growth, you're gonna lose those impact fees. You're, you're gonna have to slow down growth. Then you're gonna lose impact fees. You're going to, you're going to, lose, you're going to lose some impact fees. The but whole thing is gonna slow down. Because you've got to costly. be able to catch up. The schools say they have to be able to catch up. The road maintenance has to be able to catch up. You have some impact fees coming in now. The whole thing is take a deep breath. You're going to have to slow down. You cannot keep, you cannot keep this pace going. And without this, this pace going the same way, you can't, you have to take your time and catch up. We're not going to stop growing. But for instance, this 2209 and then we're then granting the ability to be able to build these houses in a less dense area, that will create impact fees. But right now, we're in, we're way behind. We're behind the schools, we're behind the roads. So the only way out of that, in my estimation, is to raise impact fees. They say, oh, we're up 40%. Well, this, the houses in this area are going for a tremendous amount of money. So there's tremendous profit. In it. The tremendous profit is what drives all these developers here. So if, in fact, there is that much profit, then where else are you going to get the cash cow? I, uh, Ms. Blocker, I don't agree on that. Well, actually, I think, I think we, we do agree on this. It's not an impact fees. No one here wants this county to be overgrown. That's not anyone's interest. That's not, no one wants this county to be overdeveloped or overgrown. I think the issue you have to consider is under the law, you cannot use impact fees to pay for everything. If you have a development upon a vidra, those impact fees have to go to that development upon a vidra. That's not going to help residents other parts of the county that need a fire station. So we're going to have to come up with those dollars otherwise. So these are all great ideas if you look at the law. You've had a lot of great ideas about how to address these issues. And then people run into lawsuits and issues with the legislature because not all this is, is being handled at our level. A lot of it's being handled at a different level. What we can control is things like adjusting the millage rates so we can fully fund those roads. What we can control is making sure the county is not overgrown by having measured managed growth. That's what we can do. So we don't have to be an overcrowded county. We can preserve our green space. We can allow good projects to add value to our community without overcrowding our county. And we can do it in a very measured way. We can do it within the law. We can operate within the law and do that in an effective way. So what I'm saying is impact fees are fool's gold. They're not, if you're relying on impact fees to pay for everything, you're going to come up short every time. We have to look at some other ways of doing that. Does either of you support a, a referendum for a sales tax or an increase in the sales tax? The sales tax, there's a sales, I was at a Honolulu Beach <clears throat> meeting and I wanted to talk in kind of uh, most scientific terms about how to re-nourish the beach. And they wanted the one cent sales tax because they felt, and the, the beach is really heavily damaged. But if you're ever going to, if you're gonna tax and tax and tax and tax, you have to be able to sunset these things. I mean, yes, I would vote for a one cent sales tax to be able to re-nourish those beaches because they're heavily damaged. But then you're gonna to have to sunset this thing, put an end to it because for instance, our share, because there's a, the federal matching dollars don't don't go to the whole beach because 
Nicholas Landing is the only public area. So you're going to have to go between 1.2 and 1.6. Well, that, that proposal is actually from the Fed tax, which, which is in yes. exactly the same. Well, I got it. tax, tax, tax. Right. But, um, tax, tax, tax. What I mean is something. Fed tax is a sales tax. Yes, sales tax, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, a, a smaller pot. Um, and I think what you're talking about, I think you're saying under the law, they're, they're two different things. So, so to, to improve a bed tax, is, there's a different procedure for approving that under the law than there is for sales tax. Under the sales tax, it would, can't commission would put that on a referendum to, to vote for it. The last time this came up, there was a lot of opposition to it and it did not go forward. So, my question is we need to be as efficient as we can in local government. You have other counties around us that do not have the revenue streams that we have, do not have the the massive development that we have do not have all the Avalon taxes coming in. They have to work within a budget. They still have to maintain the roads and do from that. So if we can identify serious gaps in, in our funding that we have to cover down on, if we've made sure that we're efficient, the county's an efficiency audit. Before we sell the voters on a sales tax, let's make sure we're being as efficient as possible. Now I've talked to a lot of voters in St. John's County, and a lot of people feel there are areas and departments we can be more efficient at. So let's start with that, and then if we've identified that and we can show the voters, like, look, we've done a top to bottom look at every department, we've looked at how we're spending the dollars, we've looked at our staffing, we've made sure that we're focused on the next 10, 15 years, so when your dollars are going into the county, they're being used effectively, if we can do that, and we're still coming up short, then that's something we can consider. But I'm not in favor of the sales tax. I'm not in favor of that. I think that's irresponsible to jump right to that. I think what we have to do is let's make sure we're efficient, use those dollars effectively. Also, the other thing we're not doing is we need to bring in more grant money. The county has missed out on some opportunities to bring in grant money to cover some specific areas. You know, other counties around us have a unified grant writing department to really focus on that kind of manage that process. So we can, we can look at that, we can improve. So again, it's not that we're doing everything wrong, we're doing some really good things here, but we need to get better. We need to improve. We need to figure out where we want to go and start moving towards that. What about the uh, the question of the Fed tax increase to fund or to kick in the funds from the from the feds in the state to uh, renourish the beaches? Would either of you support that or, or be against it? I was just talking about that. I would support it, but I want sunset. In other words, it doesn't go on forever. Okay. Because uh, I'm going to jump in, but because of the, actually you're going to be building a reserve. In other words, you need 1.2 to 1.6 for our portion, the county's portion, to be able to get then the state portion to be able to renourish the beach. But there's a reserve built because it, it's, I think it was exactly, uh, not exactly, but 2.4 it's going to generate. So you're going to generate, you know, over a million dollar reserve every year. So it, the whole thing needs to be reevaluated after five years. Because every time, for instance, you know, I'll get myself in trouble, and I'm in trouble all the time. In other words, the, uh, the, the city of St. Augustine had a bed tax, and they put the bed tax on because they wanted to fund uh, actual promotion of the city of St. Augustine. Okay. And then they got so many darn beds that uh, they had a surplus. They could, didn't need to spend that much money on promotion. So now they're looking, it's become a slush fund. They're looking at infrastructure. That wasn't what the people voted for. So if you're going to vote for a tax on an emergency basis, you've got to sunset it, in my opinion. You've got to be able to retire. I mean, I'm not interested in tax because I'm more interested in reallocating those dollars to Ponte Vigia. Ponte Vigia puts close to about two to three million dollars into our, our, our the, the revenues from, from, from tours and bed tax. I'd like to bring those dollars back to Ponte Vigia. That's our district. That's what, that's where I'm representing. The beaches are important to me. That's one of the reasons we moved here. I've been coming to St. Augustine since before I could walk. Going to those beaches are important. So those dollars are there, but we need to reallocate those to, to St. Augustine. Again, if we've done everything we can and we're still coming up short, then that's something we can consider. But you know, the interesting thing when this issue came up before was they weren't able to guarantee there was nothing requiring those dollars to go to the beach, re beach renourishment. So the county has an obligation to address the beach renourishment issues. We got to save our beaches. That's important. That's important to people that live here. That should be important to everyone in the county. But we need to make sure that the dollars that are coming from Ponte Beach are going back to Ponte Beach to restore those beaches. So let's let's figure that out first before we increase taxes again. So I'm, I'm confused. Are you in, do you oppose the one cent at this time? Yes. In, in bed tax only? at this time? Yes. Okay. Unless you can guarantee those dollars are going to go back to the beach, I don't think it's a good idea. And right now, there's nothing in place to make that happen. I think it's well, pretty, pretty much dead. Dead. That's going to happen. Yeah. That's the only. That's the way the ordinance is written. 
South, South Palm Beach. Right, they, they would have to relook at that. And you know, when you look at Volusia County, some of the other counties, the way they've approached this, they're using those tourism, they're bringing those tourism dollars back to those particular districts. And I think we can take a hard look at that. Um, again, you know, the tourism industry is important to St. Augustine. We want to preserve that and protect that because we're competing against Charleston and Savannah. But at the same time, those dollars, I think, need to come back to Ponte Vedra. Let me get clear on that. I got to ask you so you would or would not vote for the one sunset? No, I would not vote for it right now. As is now. Because right you can't guarantee those dollars are going to come back to the beach. Well, that would be the cabinet. That's not the way it was written. So you'd, have, you'd, have to, you'd have to come back. It's not it. written for Ponte Vedra. It's written it's specifically for South Ponte Vedra right. and the North it's Ponte Vedra. It kicks, it kicks in money from the feds and the state, separate pots that go specifically right. to uh, renourishment of a certain portion of the beach. So right, one five miles, but not Ponte But without, without those matching funds or without the kick in from St. John's County, the money goes away. Well, and to be clear, the, the feds and state government are not saying we have to raise. They're, they're saying we have to come up with the dollars. There's no one saying, hey, you have to do that. Right. They're not the saying we're, we're, we're. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, so there, there, there are, there's other ways to come up with that revenue. And again, when you have the debate on it in the county commission, several of the county commissioners pointed that out. There are other, there are other revenue streams we could have done that. One was to reallocate. There are other different ways that you could do that. Again, about, you know, we're looking at about two to three million dollars. You know, Ponte Vedra alone, just from the tourism, puts about two or three million in bed taxes in the county. So those dollars are coming back right now. Um, you know, that's, that might be a possible uh, source. So again, I think we need, before we raise taxes, that, that's, that's an easy answer to always raise taxes. So let's look at if there are other dollars that we can bring in into play. So, well, if, where's the dollars going to come from? I got to argue with you. Well, no, it's, no. because we're behind in almost every aspect. Uh, we're behind in road, we're behind in school, we're behind. So where do they come from if you don't get, I, I don't want to raise taxes either. Everybody hates taxes. But you, and you got a sun, in my attitude is you've got to sunset these things. But the immediate need is to fix that beach. We have, like I just said, about two or three million a year that goes into our, our tourism tax for Ponte Beach. Are those dollars coming back to Ponte Beach or Jack? Well, you'd have to. Not. Have so to we need to go back and bring those dollars down. Right, you got to do an ordinance under the law because these are all great ideas until we actually do what the county commission can do. You have to write into a law or you have to do an ordinance and bring that. So right now, even if they pass a bed tax, as you want to do, that's not going to solve the problem of putting that sand on the beach. You have to put the ordinance in place to do it. What, what, what's happening is they're going to raise the tax, then go back and address that. So you need to have that structure in place first to make sure those dollars come back. So you're not going to a big pot. Didn't say we weren't going to. We're going to do it without the proper structure in place. What they were saying is if the proper structure was in place, it wasn't in place. Well, the structure's not in place now, so vote for a bed tax now, which is put more dollars into a pot that's not coming back to Ponder Vedra, the areas that need it. So we need to make sure that we have that in place first. Well, I would agree with that. I mean, you've got to have it written properly. Sure. You're the lawyer. <laughs> I would agree with that, yeah. We got to make sure we operate within the law. Again, these are great ideas until you start. Going outside of that. And truthfully, some of the TDC dollars are going back to Ponte Vedra. I mean, it's spent for advertising for St. John's County for you know sure. all the beaches and everything else. It's spent as much for Ponte Vedra as it is for St. Honor or more, obviously. But at any rate, no one no one is ready to buff the ones that turn to all the tax in this one. It's unpopular, I know. It's but you've got to be able to fix this thing. It is unpopular. I mean all tax rates are unpopular. I'm still having a bit of a fog about the millage, where the magic millage comes from, where we're going to reallocate for that. Well, it's not if you go back 10 years ago and look how they adjusted the millage rate, it's very simple. You would go back and readjust that back. So you're fully funding the Transportation Trust Fund. They shifted a, a millage rate over from the Transportation Trust Fund to the general fund. Right. And now the schools are telling me the same thing. They lost right. millage. In 2008, they lost millage. So we're well, well, the school, so the school we're millage rate is different. The school millage rate is different. Under the law, that's, that's different. That's, that's different. completely separate, not, not related. It may be separate, but it is still part of the taxation structure. So there was somebody's going to pay. Right. Not controlled by the county, but yes. again, no. shifting that would not raise property taxes. You're adjusting, you're paying the same amount of property tax. You're you're shifting what pot those dollars go into. That's important. To understand. I guess what I understand is when you shift more into one pot, the other pot gets smaller. And, That's and you you keep saying that just no, we're just moving it over, and everything's the same. But if you if you have a million dollar pot, then you shift 
a hundred thousand over to infrastructure, you're a hundred thousand dollars right. short on the other side. Well, it seems to me. Sure. Well, that's why you had to be efficient. That's why we have to make sure we're being efficient. Before we ask the taxpayers to put their wallets put more dollars in, we need to make sure we're being more efficient. So we have we have a mechanism in place to to address our transportation needs. Why don't we do that? Why don't we address that before we start asking the taxpayers to put their wallets and put more dollars in? You got to show that we're being efficient before we start going down that road of raising taxes. So respectfully, I disagree that we need to. To do that, is there an area you hear of where, where there's inefficiency, something that is glaring and, and would be easy to examine and find some savings? The, the last time the county is really, to, to my knowledge, really, so every year the county has to do, uh, you know, you have to have, you know, independent review of, of counting and all that. But I think what that's not doing is not looking at efficiency. Do we have the right staffing in place at particular departments? Do we have the right structure in place? And we need, you know, the sheriff for a while now has needed more sheriff deputies because as we grow, you need more law enforcement. We have firefighters that you know, we need to get more equipment. So that's part of local government. You have to prioritize and shift things. You can't pay for everything all the time. That's not, not, the, not the way it works. We want to, but you have to really prioritize that. So I think what we have to do is when you look at how some of our departments are staffed, how some of them are, are doing particular processes. Is it the most effective today as it was 10 years ago? You know, any small business, you got to look at, you know, how you're doing business today compared to last year. You got to constantly improve. You got to do better. Um, we have a lot of work to do in that area. We got to make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. I don't have a specific department saying, hey, look, we need to gut that. I think we got to look at what other counties have done, do a top to bottom approach, and look at every department and say, hey, you know, where, where's the efficiency on it? Um, you know, are we staffed the right way or are we doing, you know, we have a great permanent department, you know, uh, but do we need to keep that the same staffing that we had 10 years ago? Do we need to maybe increase some there? So all this is ebb and flow. But before we ask the taxpayers to put more money in, let's make sure we're using this dollars effectively. Okay. I have one of those questions that, that you have very specific ideas and you have very specific ideas, but when you get on the county commission, you're one of five. We have a very different, let's say, uh, with, with a pretty wide range of, of sensibilities on the county commission that, that are not going to work with, with, with exactly what you want or you want. Are you both think you're in a position of the compromise and move around? It, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. That's I think the hardest lesson commission candidates learn is when they get in there that whatever they want isn't what's going to happen. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think what's important to understand is, you know, I've been, you know, you, you have to work with others. You have to, you have to bridge that gap. This is not this is not an executive position where you get in there and get to snap a finger and do it. You know, when I was in Iraq, I had Kurds and Arabs that were fighting over water. And we had to come to consensus there because there wasn't enough water for everybody. So you have to work with others, you have to build that consensus. So I think you have to go on the county commission, you have to build common ground. So you're not going to, that's one of the reasons you have to be very careful with, you know, being very very adamant about specific things. We know we're not going to do this or not do that. You have to work with others and make sure they do that. The bed tax is a great example. You know, Jack can be for a bed tax all day long, but you need to get more people in the county commission to support that. You have to work with what you have. You have to be persuasive. You have to make good arguments. You have to listen to the citizens. You remember, the bed tax is a sunset of tax. It is not going to last forever. We passed a, a tax for an emergency tax for the schools, and it was tied to school safety. But in effect, it's actually school safety, and they use that money to play catch up to be able to uh, build the schools to the point they needed to be. Uh, I, it, efficiencies are one thing, but if you have an expanding situation like you have here, well, you can you can beat on efficiencies all you want, but when things expand, you require more. You require more services. You require more everything. So I, after a while, yes, you could probably ring a few dollars in efficiencies, but you're still going to have to be able to expand the amount of bottom line dollars that are coming in. I don't, uh, I can't whitewash everything with that. In other words, uh, it's the here and now, where does the money come from? And the residents are, they're fed up. I mean, I get in trouble, but it's the reality of it. I get in trouble with the bed tax, pushing a bed tax. I don't really want a bed tax, who does? But, I mean, how are you gonna fix it now? And I don't agree with Mr. Blocker that studying efficiencies is going to raise the money in time to do anything. Do you guys have anything else particular? No. What we normally do is just give you guys a couple minutes to kind of wrap up. If, or if there's a question that you think is important that we haven't asked you, you got some time now to sort of wrap the thing up and 
we'll go we'll start with you. Sure. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come here. I want to thank Mr. Mr. Gorman as well. Um, you know, everyone here cares about this county, and we care about the next 10 or 15 years. And St. John's County is the next 10 or 15 years going to have some important challenges. We talked about some of this today. We're going to have revenue issues. We're going to, we have issues right now with transportation. We're going to have issues with school safety. That's important to me as a parent raising kids here. My kids are going to be going to these schools. We have issues with firefighters, so we need to make sure they're fully funded and have all the equipment they need to be effective. You don't want to have a cardiac arrest or drowning on the beach and a house fire at the same time and not the resources to address that. We need more sheriff's deputies. We have a lot of things coming up that we're going to need to address. We have to be very measured in how we do this. We have to be decisive, and you need a plan. You need to get in there. You need to work with four other people. You can have all the great ideas in the world. You can come up with all these great platitudes, but you have to know how to work within the law, and you have to understand these issues at the core. You have to understand how other communities are addressing this. With my background experience, I've studied these issues. I've worked on this. I understand how land use works. I understand how our land use code works. I understand how all that clearing that we're seeing, how that goes to part of our land use code that needs to be updated. That's one of the reasons we're having some of these issues. When it comes to just raising taxes and, 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 and not showing efficiency, you have to be able to share that to the voters. Because guess what? If you come to a sales tax, the voters get to vote on that. So before you call for a sales tax, you got to make sure that the voters understand that we've been as efficient as possible. So that's not whitewashing. That's, that's dealing with reality. So what we have to do is we have to really address these issues. We have to do it in a very measured way. And we need to demonstrate to our citizens we're being responsive. We need responsible government. Local government should be the most responsive, the most in tune with its, its citizens' needs. And we have to work hard to do that. We have to build that trust. We have to manage our growth better. We have to be more effective in doing that. I understand how to do that. I understand how to work within the law and keep this county from being overgrown. I understand how important it is to bring projects in. They're going to add value to the county, not overgrow and add to our transportation issues. But we have to be very measured in that. We have to make sure that we only allow development into this county that's good for the whole county, not just a few. So going forward, I'm going to ask for your vote. I'm going to ask for your support because when I get on there, I'm not just voting for my family, I'm voting for your family as well and how this is going to affect us. And we need to be making decisions for the next 15, 20 years, not just being reactive. And that takes strategic planning, and that takes looking at innovative ideas, and that means being open to different ideas that maybe are different for this county. And we can maintain our values, and we can ma maintain our, you know, we have a lot of people in this county that are fixed incomes. We have a lot of small, small mom and pops. You raise the, bed, raise the bed tax, you're going to affect a lot of small bed and breakfasts in St. Augustine. So before you make those decisions, we need to make sure we've exhausted all our efforts and we're being strategic in how we're doing this. We're not running from one problem to the next. So I'm going to ask for your support and ask for your vote, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, let's not get hung up on a bed tax. In other words, this hasn't passed. It's up for discussion. I was on the airport board for eight years working with the government, and the government is a very complicated piece. We do a 10-year plan every year. Every year you do a new 10-year plan, it seems like that. And that's the, the long and the short of it. And you have to be able to, the whole situation is what do the residents get and what do the residents want? It's not what I want. I mean, it, it isn't what I want. It's what the residents want. And I'm trying to actually bring a clear voice for the residents, seats are fulfilled, and that they are actually feel that they're empowered, that it is their government, it is not an us and them government. And many times I think government is us and them. In other words, they get wrapped up in their own, their own vernacular, they get wrapped up in their own politics, and uh, the residents are actually left behind. When the King's Grant was uh, turned down, it was a good idea to turn it down, there were 70 people that got up there. It took several hours to hear them all. They had ideas I had never heard of, <clears throat> and I think that's important. And so whether or not, uh, I think a bed tax is, is useful, it's up to the residents, it's not up to me. And they can come up with other ideas, and their ideas then need to be brought forward. If I have to have a book this thick for the residents' ideas and present them to the board every month, so be it, that's what will happen. So <clears throat> uh, with eight years' experience uh, with the convolutions of government, I would like your vote. I have, uh, I would appreciate your vote because I think I could provide the experience uh, necessary to be able to do the job right. And I will do the job just like an eight to five job. Stay on it and do the best job I can. Thank you guys. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. 
Um, you can turn it on. 